Hello, this is Science and Ponies here, bringing you a sadly somewhat belated special video to celebrate 1,000 subscribers. Today, I'm going to do a video that I've really wanted to do for a while now, Quantum Mechanics Explained with Ponies. And I'm going to try to explain some basics of quantum mechanics with as little math as possible, which is a fairly ridiculous concept because there's a lot of math in quantum mechanics. But, let's try it. So, the story of quantum mechanics is actually the story of light. And ever since the time of Aristotle, the question has been, is light a wave or a particle? Well, the wave theory gained general acceptance after Thomas Young's 1803 double slit experiment. But what is a double slit experiment? Well, first, we shine light onto a barrier with two tiny slits in it. As the light comes out, each slit acts as its own individual light source. And like ripples in a pond, these waves interfere with each other and cause an interference pattern. If you didn't know, waves interfere with each other. It has dark bands where they destructively interfere and light bands where they constructively interfere. This pretty much confirmed light as a wave. Or did it? Holes soon began to emerge. First of all was the discovery of the electron. Electricity had long been thought to be a fluid. It may seem silly now, but it worked at the time. It led to the invention of batteries, generators, dynamos, and arc lamps, all while believing that electricity was a fluid. In 1897, J.J. Thompson is messing around with cathode ray tubes, which you may know as vacuum tubes, those really old things and old-timey TVs. Well, this led to the discovery of the electron as the particle of electricity. This left scientists quite confused as a lot of work had already been done on the field of electromagnetism by Faraday and Maxwell. It had been strongly determined to be a wave generated by a changing electric or magnetic field, which is true. Another issue of the time was black body radiation. You may know that when you heat an object up enough, it begins to glow. It'll glow red hot, then turn yellow, eventually get white hot or even blue if you get it hot enough. Now classical physics had been unable to properly explain this. According to the equipartition theorem, which is the basis of all classical thermodynamics, an object's energy has to be equally distributed amongst all its vibrational modes. This means if there's a certain number of ways that a particle can jiggle, then its energy has to be equally distributed between all of those forms of jiggling. Now, this rule should also hold for energy emitted from it in the form of light. So people thought to study this by sticking the object in a cavity where its waves would be restricted to standing waves. Now here's where you may need to know a little bit about standing waves. This might come more naturally to those of you who knows something about music or harmonics. The most basic form of standing wave uses the walls as nodes and just goes up and down like this. Its wavelength is actually twice the size of the space of the cavity. Cavity. So this is one half of a wavelength. At a node, here we have a full wavelength. Up here, three halves of a wavelength. Keep adding a node and you shorten the wavelength. It has to follow this kind of pattern. And these are standing waves. So this set an upper limit on the wavelength. It couldn't be larger than 2L, where L is the length of the cavity. However, there is a problem. Though there was an upper limit on the size of wavelengths, there was no lower limit. You could just keep adding nodes indefinitely and get smaller and smaller wavelengths. If energy had to be equally distributed amongst all of these, this meant that if a heated object in a cavity was emitting anything at all, it had to be emitting an infinite amount of power. Now obviously this wasn't the case, we didn't just have infinite energy sources sitting around, so this model failed spectacularly. The thing was, it actually did a very good job of predicting long wave radiation, but failed completely at short wave, or in the ultraviolet zone. This became known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. So Max Planck stepped in and resolved this problem in 1900. He hypothesized that the frequency of emitted light 
depended on the frequency of an oscillator that emitted that light. So the energy of these oscillators would increase with frequency according to this rule here, E equals HV, where V is frequency and H is a value called Planck's constant. This means that higher frequency oscillators required more energy. So if you distribute all that energy equally amongst different oscillators, then you'd have fewer and fewer high frequency oscillators because they'd use up the energy more quickly until it would go to zero. Problem solved. However, by putting forth an integer number of oscillators and setting this E equals HV rule, that meant oscillators couldn't absorb energy that wasn't this multiple of HV. They couldn't, for a given frequency, absorb any less than HV. This means you had quantized light. It couldn't just come in any amount. It had to come in specific little packets, chunks, or quanta of energy that were a multiple of HV. Now, Planck thought this was just some mistake, some limitation of his theory. Surely when someone else came along and did the work properly, they would get a more elegant response that got rid of this strange error. Light had already been determined to be a wave. There's no way it could be quantized. However, there was another thing called the photoelectric effect. People have been studying these strange new things called electrons ever since they were discovered. In 1901, Tesla discovered that if you expose metal to high frequency light, you get high energy electrons coming out of them. A year later, Philip Leonard discovers that the energies, energy of these electrons only depends on frequency, not how much light you shine on it. If you shine more light of the same frequency, you just get more electrons of the same energy. In 1905, Albert Einstein uses Planck's work on black body radiation to explain this strange photoelectric effect in terms of quantized light. This is actually what won him his 1921 Nobel Prize, not his work on relativity. So you may be wondering, is light a wave or a particle? Well, it turns out, both. Light has both wave and particle-like properties. If you test it as a wave, it's a wave. If you test it as a particle, it's a particle. This is known as wave-particle duality. That's not even the real doozy. What could be doozier than that? Going back to the double slit experiment, suppose we try it with electrons, which we know for sure are particles. We send them through, through these slits. We would think we'd get a pattern kind of like this. We'd have a pattern in the shape of the two slits. They might be kind of wide if they come in at an angle here, but we have two straight lines. These are particles, after all. When we run it, we see something very strange, the same old interference pattern. And you may be thinking, oh, okay, maybe electrons go through at the same time and bounce off each other and somehow make this pattern. Well, we can set, do our setup so that electrons are fired one at a time, and we still get this interference pattern. Somehow, the same electron is going through both slits at the same time to interfere with itself. How is that possible? Well, it turns out wave-particle duality applies to more than just light. Even things that consider real particles can be considered waves with the wavelength given by lambda equals h over p. h is Planck's constant, p is momentum, and lambda is something called the de Broglie wavelength or the wavelength of these matter waves. Now normally, this doesn't matter too much because the momentum of most particles is massive compared to Planck's constant. This Planck's constant is very tiny. So their wave properties are pretty much negligible. But electrons are so small, they have a small enough mass and thus momentum, since momentum is just mass times velocity, that their wave properties are actually significant. This is the concept behind electron microscopes. The ultra-small wavelengths of electrons give much higher resolution than any kind of wavelength from optical light. This is also why in chemistry now we talk about electrons as more of a cloud in various orbital shapes, kind of smeared out over an area as a wave. So this wave nature of particles carries some implications with it. 
First of all, imagine a transverse wave on a string, kind of like a wave down here. What would you say its position is? Well, it doesn't really have much of a position. It's a wave. It's kind of spread out over an, a an area. Just like waves don't really have a well-defined position, particles don't have perfectly defined positions either. And just a single wave pulse, say, this part right here, one little pulse of a wave, doesn't really have a defined wavelength. Particles have imperfectly defined wavelengths as well, and thus imperfectly defined momenta, because wavelength and momentum are linked. Turns out these two uncertainties are linked together by something called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Here we have delta x times delta p equals h over 4 pi. This is normally written h bar over 2, but h bar is just h over 2 pi. So I decided to write it this way. So again, x is position, p is momentum, h is Planck's constant. This means there's a maximum level of precision you can know position and momentum for. If you try to measure position more precisely, you gain more uncertainty in momentum. If you try to measure momentum more precisely, you gain uncertainty in position. You can never know both perfectly. And here, I shamelessly steal an old quantum mechanics joke. So now we get into the real meat of quantum mechanics, what everything's really based on. The wave function psi. So psi is a function that takes in time and space and describes a particle's state and behavior. It takes a position and a time and tells you the probability for that position and time of finding that particle if you were to measure for it. The higher the amplitude at a specific place and time, the higher the chance you will find it there. Down here we see some graphs, and here at the peaks are your most likely places to find their particle. Here it's kind of blurred out to show a stronger chance of being here. It has zero chance of being at these nodes. And although psi is a complex number, meaning it has real and imaginary parts, imaginary meaning it has the square root of negative one i running around in there, its product, psi squared, is a real value known the pro called the probability density. It's a real value that can be measured. So if this is psi, psi squared, these parts would all be positive. So important part, peaks, where you're most likely to find it, Nodes, we have zero chance of finding it, and in between chances, there. Superposition. Now, it's not that we just don't know where the particle is until we measure it. In a way, it actually is in all of those places at once. Its existence is spread out amongst all those different places. This is called superposition. This is why the electron was actually able to interfere with itself in the double slit experiment. It was in a state of superposition when passing through both slits at the same time. Now collapsing the wave function. The state of superposition only lasts as long as the particle is not observed, measured, detected, etc. Once you observe, measure, detect it, then it collapses. Now observe doesn't mean with the human eye. It can mean picked up by a detector or interacting with any other form of matter. When measured, this function collapses and it's forced to pick a location. And it, this happens at random. There's no way to know for sure where it's going to be, except by following the probability density that gives you an idea of where it's most likely to be. So back to that double slit experiment again. The electron exists in superposition, goes through both slits, interferes with itself, and then hits the photographic plate or film strip at the back that forms the screen. Once it hits that plate, it's detected and is forced to pick a position. It becomes a dot on the film. We run this test over and over, more dots form, and they form this interference pattern because these are the peaks where it's most likely to appear, the dark bands are where it's least likely to appear. So over many, many trials, this pattern emerges. But what happens if we put a detector 
in the slits. Suddenly, our interference pattern disappears and we get our old predicted model of what particles should do. Uh, but I... what? How can this be? It turns out with the detectors in place in the slits, it's collapsing the wave function earlier, so the particle actually has to pick which slit it's going to go through. It can't go through both anymore, so it can't interfere with itself. And since this video is already running pretty long, I wanted to add a lot more stuff, but I didn't want this to drag on forever, so maybe I'll add it in an upcoming video sometime in the future. I would cover a particle in a box, which is a basic scenario you set up to solve quantum mechanics problems. It's the most basic scenario you can solve analytically. It acts as a good approximation for more complicated problems. It's a necessary setup to explain quantum tunneling, it's a really interesting phenomenon that highlights the differences between classical and quantum mechanics. It also explains the root cause of radioactive decay. So, thanks for watching, and thanks for the 1,000 subscribers. I hope you all keep watching in the future.